Okay, well, it's uh, September 21st, 2010, and we're here with Alan Jones. Hi, Alan. How do you do today? I'm, I'm well. How are you? Fine. Good. So we're going to kind of talk about the story of your life. Well, that'll be interesting. That'll be interesting. <laughs> I haven't thought about it lately. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So you're an Atlanta native, right? I was uh, born in Conyers, Georgia. Um, Conyers. About 3.30 in the afternoon. And what, what, what day was that? That was June 4th. Okay, 1937. 1937. June 4th is the day that everything happened, on, like Tenement Square, the invasion of Normandy came on the 5th. Any, any great event seems to settle around June 4th, June 5th. <laughs> and my mother sent the children away and had, the, had me at home. Then I was the youngest. There were uh, three brothers. One, well, there would have been four, but one died in childbirth. And uh, my mother made the newspapers at that point by keeping a Virgil vigil at the hospital. Uh, and two sisters, all of whom have passed except one brother. Uh, but in the process, had more than 55 nieces, nephews, grandnieces, grandnephews. So there's still quite a crowd left. Mm -hmm. Although I'm closest to one nephew that's in Tennessee, and the only one that we know of that was gay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, tell us about your father. Uh, uh, who was he? What did he do? I never knew him because he was in the uh, service and he got pneumonia in the days when you couldn't cure pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And he died when I was one. Uh, so, my oldest brother was sort of a surrogate father. That was Fred. He's the one that had all the children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he kind of um, he was he was one you looked to as a father figure. Or? Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we lived in Conyers at that time. But then, uh, during the Second World War, it was too long a train ride for my sisters to come to work at Atlanta. So we moved to Atlanta at that point in time for me to go to Moreland Grammar School, uh, which is now a community center, and Bass High School, which is uh, condominiums, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then after that, Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. So when did you start at Georgia Tech? 1955. Okay. Okay. And, and what, what did you study? Industrial management. Mm -hmm. I entered in industrial management because I applied for a scholarship and got a scholarship from, I think it was Atlanta Federal Savings, not in business anymore, uh, for $500. And that was enough to pay the quarterly tuition of $78 and to buy books and took care of an entire year. Uh, after that, during my, <coughs> starting at 10 years old, all boys in those days worked. So starting at 10, I started a paper round. Um, I had been shagging balls on the golf course, but my mother announced it was time for me to go to work. So I uh, went down to the newspaper office and they said, you're too young. So I went back home and told her, they said I was too young. And she said, well, I'll walk down there with you and we'll talk to them about it. So we walked all the way down there and when we got across the street, I said, if you'll stay here, I'll go get the job. <laughs> and so I convinced him to take me at 10. By 16, I uh, had been branch captain and then uh, I went to work downtown at the General Constitution um, on the complaint desk. And the other two people that worked on the complaint desk were students at North Fulton. And that gave me an introduction to a whole different life, the Buckhead life, in addition to my background on the five points. Uh, so that certainly changed things. So when you moved uh, from Conyers to Atlanta, you moved into Little Five Points? Yes. Okay. Where, where in Little Five Points? first house was on Elmira, uh -huh. which is off to Cab Avenue. 
Actually, the first house was on DeKalb Avenue, one of those huge houses that has been was split up at the time into apartments, but it, they appear in the cyclorama mm. in one of the scenes. There are three of them, and I lived in one of those, then Elmira, and then Decatur while I was going to Georgia Tech. And during my time at Georgia Tech, probably about the uh, sophomore year, I saw a note on the bulletin board about uh, $300 a month in training. And so obviously, when $300 a month was a big full-time salary, I applied for that, and it was uh, selling life insurance. Mm -hmm. So for the last two years, I sold life insurance on the campus. And uh, then continued the life insurance business for about a year after graduating. And it was during that time that uh, after I graduated, uh, I went to a Young Republican meeting in DeKalb County with my brother-in-law, who was a member of the Young Republicans. And uh, after the meeting, I said, well, all we all did was talk. It didn't seem like you were doing anything productive. At the next meeting, I was elected president. So I came up with a uh, course that was produced by the Chamber of Commerce that was how to take over your precinct. And so I started teaching that course to the young Republicans, and uh, that then led to radio interviews about uh, that precinct course. And that was probably the first radio interview I did. Were you a big uh, Richard Nixon supporter? Because mm -hmm. Nixon, I remember Nixon ran for president in 1960. In 60, I went to work for the, uh, let's see, it wasn't 60, it was 64, <laughs> I guess. I went to work for the National Committee mm -hmm. uh, during the Goldwater campaign and did some advance work for his son and also had two states, Florida and Indiana. But we knew right away we were going to lose by an enormous margin. But it was a joy to meet Goldwater, who was a very good father and also non-discriminatory. He was the one, the big discrimination in Arizona was against uh, Mexicans, Hispanics, and his department store promoted them just like anybody else. And one Sunday, I had picked up Barry Jr. at the airport because he was at an event here in Atlanta. And he said, I, he, he said, I need to stop and talk to my father first. And so we went to, I got him a hotel room, we went and called his father. And I did not realize, but it was Father's Day. And listening to their conversation, it was very obvious that uh, they had a wonderful, close, loving family, so I greatly admire them for that. Um, speaking of discrimination, um, when did you when did you consciously realize that you were gay? Oh, uh, <clears throat> well, I was probably gay from birth, but I didn't really face that issue until after Georgia Tech. After Georgia Tech. Right. But back in um, 62, I got elected uh, chairman of the Georgia Young Republicans by beating Newt Gingrich. And uh, in later years, I was at a meeting with Newt and I told him uh, that reporters were giving him a hard time about being so conservative. And I said, Newt, go over there and tell them that I beat you because I called you a uh, Rockefeller liberal. <laughs> and so uh, that may have been what sparked Newt to get out. He went to every county after he lost that, that race and started um, campaigning, and that may have sparked him rising through the Republican ranks to Speaker of the House. I told a, uh, when I was speaking to the AEN at one time, I told them about, uh, yeah, in those days we had a Saturday night soiree a cocktail party in Colonial Homes. And I told him if there'd been a photographer there, he could conceivably have captured Ted Turner, 
myself, Sandy Miller, who became a billionaire, Paul Coverdale, who was a senator, Newt Gingrich, and there were a couple of others like that. So Ted Turner was a Republican? Hmm? Ted Turner was a Republican? Well, he was there for our cocktail parties. I'm not <laughs> sure whether he was a Republican at the time or not. We always knew when he got to the colonial homes because there'd be this big noise, he and two dollars coming up the steps. <laughs> Um, but he was a great guy. He, would, uh, he had won those yacht races, um, would have continued to be a yachtsman if his father hadn't died. He had to take over the uh, outdoor sign company, which he only had 30 days uh, after his father died to do something or else he'd lose all of that inheritance. But whatever it was, he did. And then he started WTBS and it went on from there. So in 1962, um, you were talking about, um, you said you said you, you became head of the Young Republicans locally, or? I was president of the statewide Young Republicans. Okay, statewide Young Republicans. For 62. And, and, and did, you, did you have any kind of realization at that time? You said that was after you graduated from Georgia Tech and that you might be gay. Yes. Okay. Tell, tell, us, about, was, tell us about, like, you I know. I thought I was the only one. The only one, right. I came to, I found out differently when I happened to be driving on Monroe Drive and all of these young men were arriving at that a huge place on Monroe that was a, a dance bar. And so I drove by there a couple of Friday nights and then got up enough nerve to go in there and the whole place was full of people which I just sat down at the table and was, it was an amazing site to me. What, what was the name of that place, Jerome? I don't know. Okay. I'm yeah, it drive. got burned down later. Oh, okay. During okay. the Wild West days. Yeah. We have to talk about the Wild West days. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, did you, did, so the, then you were able to find other, other people by going to that, to that, that bar. That's and, and making friends. And, yeah. You. Anybody do you remember from that, from that, uh, uh no, time? No, it's been too far back. Been too, too long ago. Yeah. Um, but the. Uh, Were you aware of the fact that there was a kind of small gay rights movement that there was, Mattachine Society and in the in the in the sixties. Yeah, 60s? well, I read a lot. Oh, okay, so you knew of it. So I knew it existed. Okay. But of course, nobody in those days would have admitted they knew anything about that. Right. Not with the discrimination that we had at that time. Yeah. Tell us about what the discrimination was like. Well. It created more problems than maybe you can imagine, but uh, when a person tries to hide who they are, then it creates such internal problems that it can just ruin their life. And that led, of course, to a lot of drinking. That's why the, the drinking and uh, all the sex was occurring in the bars and out otherwise because of uh, trying to compensate for the fact that you were repressed in the community. Even up to, let's see, 92, when we began the, Ken was part of setting up the Atlanta Executive Network. Uh, the first meeting, was, it was hard to find a place to meet because seeing all these guys in a hotel room, if somebody walked by, they might tell their mother. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, we finally found a room at, on the first floor of the Colony Square Hotel. And that happened to be the evening of the Rodney King riots. And so Joe Porter, who was the vice president at uh, Bank South, had to climb over the burning cars in downtown Atlanta in order to get to our meeting. And the interesting thing to me was the first person they encountered when they got to our meeting was a terrific guy from our softball team that was uh, black. And so on that day, with those riots going on, he was the one that was greeting people coming to our first meeting. Let's, let's uh, uh, kind of fill in between uh, 62 and, and 92, because it's like 30 years. Um, when, when you started going out to, to the bars and everything like that, um, did you did you uh, did you think of anything 
in connection with with politics, you know, like like gay rights and 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 that because you were obviously very politically active in the Republican Party, and did you did you think about like any kind of you know initiative? Um, I was still involved in the Republican Party. Yeah, and there wasn't any gay rights movement at all. Right. Uh, that came after Stonewall. Right. And it took a while for it to get down to Atlanta. Uh, the. Uh, it's, it seems like um, when, when I talk to people that they say that uh, um, at the time they considered um, being gay to be strictly personal, private, and, and not political. Was that very how you kind of... Okay. Even in 92, when we started the AEN, Joe Porter would uh, not put the name of his employer on the name tag. That's what, one of the things I required, which you put your name and your employer on it. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't do that for a couple of three meetings. And uh, Steve Cavell, who later headed the uh, legal uh, group, he would not put his name even on the name tag. Mm -hmm. that. It took him two or three meetings before he did that. And those meetings, uh, <coughs> we kept them uh, without, we did not let the press come to the meetings until I had the members vote that they were comfortable with it. And so they voted overwhelmingly. And Tom Lamar, oh, Tom Latimer, who was uh, on the board, uh, who was head of Hill and Noten, the world's largest public relations agency, but the Atlanta branch. He arranged for the uh, Atlanta Business Chronicle to get the story of us coming out. And they took a, a, a picture of the assembled group, uh, which at that time probably 300 or 400, and uh, put it on the front page, talked about Atlanta, uh, network comes out of the closet, 600 people strong. They had an interview with a young lady in it who said, when I go back and tell my bosses that I can network every month with 400 or more people, they're just astounded. And of course that Business Chronicle article produced straits that started coming to the media, which was the purpose. Now, before you started the Atlanta Executive Network, um, you were one of the uh, first uh, openly gay people who was a gay bar owner at Shelley's. Yes. Did we so, tell, tell, tell we us about that? fell into that in 78. 78. 77, 78. That was Ron Fontaine and I decided... Who was Ron Fontaine? He was a close friend that I was uh, hung around with and we went to the bars together and uh, we were outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, we decided at a point that we needed to own a gay bar. We were in the investment banking business and we were making over $200,000 at that time, which would be like a million dollars today. So we decided we needed to own a gay bar and talked Jerry Dilks, who had owned the Lion's Head, into joining us and then a couple of other investors and we bought what was uh, Shelley's at the corner of 25th and Beach Street. Now that was a uh, uh, way outside of the, the gay ghetto. I mean, if you wanted to go to a gay bar, you went downtown to, to Prince George. Uh, so opening right flat on Peach Street in an office building, that was <laughs> pretty forward. Now was that, was that, uh, was that a, big, a big step for you? Because you were talking about, um, you know, being gay in your own personal life and, and accepting that and finding a place to go and having friends. And then, and then to so from like sixty two to seventy eight, and then suddenly, you know, for you to become a gay bar owner, I mean, that seems to be a lot more public and high profile. And the biggest step was <clears throat> Fontaine and I going down to the lawyer's office to work on the private placement memorandum, and uh, we had to put in the private placement memorandum that it was a gay bar, which I was very embarrassed about sitting there in the lawyer's office. Turned out they could care less <laughs> as long as we were paying the fees. So uh, we uh, got um, <clears throat> we got Shelley started, and it was a unique place because 
our idea was if a person has everything they want at home, they wouldn't be coming to a bar. So as I told the staff, everybody gets to know everybody and you introduce everybody to each other. And so when you came in, it was like going to your clubhouse because if you came in new and you sat down at the bar, then the bartender had the instructions to introduce you to everybody else at the bar. Uh, so you couldn't stand and pose anywhere. Uh, this was a, we had at the time a couple of ladies, one was a doctor, and they would drive up from Columbus or Macon or someplace to have dinner at Shelley's because that was the only place where they could feel comfortable. Uh, because there was always a lot of discrimination between male and female, male bars and female bars. Uh, so, but they could feel comfortable in Shelley's. And it was also drug free. That was new. Uh, a, a fellow was in there one night and he ran a limousine service and he was saying, I got this beautiful limousine. Come outside and let's take a ride around the block so I can show it to you. And I refused a couple of times and agreed. So we went out, got in the limousine, and he immediately brings out a baggie with white powder in it. And so I said, let me, let me see that. And he gave it to me and I rolled down the window and threw it out the window. And you've never seen such a commotion in your life with him yelling at the chauffeur to stop the car and him running up the street trying to find that baggie. But it was his own fault because uh, he knew that we were absolutely drug free. Now, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, did you personally experience uh, discrimination? Were you ever like caught up in a bar raid, um, like when you started going out in, in 1962 and like from that time forward? Did you have police harassment when you went out? Or? No. Okay. That was the interesting thing. Mm. I, uh, but we always appeared straight. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fontaine, I remember driving, we used to have a Saturday lunch at the Yuppie Place in Buckhead at the time. And uh, we were driving back downtown one day when AIDS was first revealed. We just dis discussed it because that Saturday morning, there was a small article in the paper that six males in San Francisco had turned up with Sacoma, I think was the name of it, the skin disorder. And that was the first sign. So at that lunch, we talked about, this may be it. <laughs> we may be gone us. Mm -hmm. And um, so on the way back, I remember I'm in the car talking about, uh, I'll never admit that I'm gay. They'll have to catch me in the act. It turned out later that uh, he did have experiences that led to him becoming uh, AIDS infected, and he died before the medicines came out. Uh, but discrimination, no. It was interesting. At Shelley's, I found out in later years that the Atlanta Police Department had assigned had, had spread the word, don't bother those guys. Those are the rich gays, leave them alone. And they assigned uh, a um, sergeant to us in case we had any trouble. We could call that sergeant, he'd come take care of it. <laughs> Never had to do it, but um, because it was a very romantic place. There was a nice opportunity to have dinner uh, with your friends. And then the dance floor, every 20 minutes, they uh, switch from disco over to a slow song so that you could dance closer together. And you never got harassed for that? for Because cause I, I, I heard that there were times in the past when the police didn't want people to be dancing the same sex. That's true. But uh, we were excluded for why we didn't know at the time. But uh, I just never had any discrimination. Now, you, you need to stay away from certain places. Right. T tell me about that, because we talked about that earlier, about, about some of the other bar owners that, that you, that some of the other people that own gay bars. Well, the famous one in the Shelley's days was uh, Mama D, who owned the big place Hollywood Hots and the locker room, which was a bathhouse. And it was her son that um, 
kill one of the bar owners uh, because they were hoping they were going to compete with one of them. And uh, so he got tried for murder and convicted. Uh, and there was the story that the backstreet manager <coughs> was given a vacation to Colorado because, uh, and then shot on the ski slopes because uh, he had irritated the management, which was reputed to be mafia at the time. So Mama D and her son Robbie Llewellyn, they were mafia? Well, they were. I don't know whether they were or not, uh -huh. but the backstreet people were reputed to be. I don't know that that was ever true, but, and I don't even know that that story was true, but it, that's the story that circulated at the time. So did you personally know Mama D? Yes, because she must have gotten the word from the police department because she would call and she'd say, come on over and bring your friends, so you know, there's no admission for you. And uh, it was odd, because she was a very severe woman, how she kowtowed to us. Mm -hmm. So did you find at the time then, like you opened Shelley's, and that the other bar owners were more like competitors than, than I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't a... No, we, a, were, con we were completely uh, differentiated because okay. we had a uh, dental service and the um, dance floor that uh, played, that stopped and played the uh, slow song so you could dance. Yeah. Um, there wasn't a, a gay uh, business uh, league. I mean, because I, I, I know there was a, a gay bar coalition later, but at the that time came later. that yeah, okay, that came. Were you, were you part of that when that when that happened? Uh, no, oh, you weren't. Okay, okay. No, we were really not into the gay scene that much. So as Ken Brett often mentioned. It's interesting in Atlanta that uh, there are these circles of people and maybe uh, circles touch and one person from one circle will know people from the other circle and, and so forth and all of these circles are going on, but uh, you can go through your life and not know a lot of these people. Yeah. Now were you involved with any of the gay political groups because there was, there was some, some gay activism that was going on in, in Atlanta? in the 70s and the 80s? No, but uh, when we had the uh, Atlanta Executive Network, that was about the time that I hired a uh, young man, uh, Brian Roundtree, to uh, work for the AEN, and um, he was one that had uh, been in the paper rolling in Maynard Jackson's driveway, we'll catch up on him. <laughs> Well, the first day of work, he showed up in combat boots and shorts, and I explained to him, well, we're going to dress differently from, from now on, but you can wear that when you go out at night. <laughs> uh, so there was an activist group, and at one point, I asked all of our AEM directors who were business leaders, I asked them to adopt one of the activist groups and help them out. And I remember one of them came back and said, that crowd talked for 25, that crowd talked for an hour about whether they were going to spend $25 or not. So I just gave them the $25 and I'm never going back. <laughs> um, were you afraid for your personal safety then with all these things going on with the other bars? or? Um, I mean, I mean, it sounds like Mama D was quite formidable, and she was. You know, but remember, she was uh, taking care of us because whatever word she got. Um, and, and you kind of, you kind of had a sense of that, right? That, that that somehow somebody was looking out for you. I was a little oblivious to it at the time. It was uh -huh. later that somebody pointed out the obvious that yeah. uh, you were untouchable. What's interesting to me when we talk about it, because because you talk about how, like, you know, in the 70s and maybe into the 80s, it was kind of like the wild, wild west. I mean, we've yes. sort of used that. So so tell us a little more so about my kind of like that. We, we used to go up to uh, Highlands on the weekends, and we were driving back one weekend on Sunday early because we were going to the opening of the bar, a huge bar on uh, Monroe Drive. 
And as we were driving back, the news came on that it was burned down that night. <laughs> so if you tried to open a bar, you didn't have a long lifespan. And I knew the owner of um, the, another big bar that was down that uh, street where Mix used to be, off Peachtree, down in there where the antique places are and everything. I think it might have been Uncle Sam's. And I knew him, and one Sunday morning, he came into my uh, driveway on his motorcycle, and he said, I just came, it was about 6 o'clock in the morning, he said, I just came by to let you know I'm leaving town because I got the word that if I don't get out of town and close that bar, that they're going to kill me. So others certainly had their problems. But you weren't personally afraid? No. Nope. Wow. I was, the only time I was afraid was during the uh, young Republican days, when right after I got elected state chairman, uh, <clears throat> we had our first meeting. And I have elected uh, a co-chairman that was African-American, Dr. Lee Shelton, who was a dentist, terrific guy. And my public relations person was Oscar Persons, who got elected on my slate. And Oscar became a famous lawyer here in Atlanta later. And uh, so I said to Oscar, we need an issue, so why don't you go down and talk to the editor of the uh, Atlanta Journal. So Oscar went and came back and he told us, well, they said you need to attack the Georgia Milk Commission because they fixed prices. And we all thought that was very funny. What, what better to go a young Republican than milk? So he said they told me to have a press conference and uh, talk about how awful it was that they were fixing milk prices. And so we had a press conference on a Saturday morning at the Piedmont Hotel, which doesn't exist anymore. It was, where the, it was the hotel, but it's where the Equal building was. One person came, a reporter who became famous later, and I can't remember his name. But the only question he asked after I did my thing was, uh, why do you call us, why did you call the, the Democratic Party Democrat Party rather than Democratic Party? And afterwards I said, you know, did you get this right, Oscar? <laughs> and he said, that's what they told me. So we woke up on Sunday mornings and across the top headlines was Young GOP Attacks Milk Commission. And that went on for three months that there was a story in the paper every day and something on television. Finally, the three television stations bid for preempting their program at 8 o'clock at night for me to, me to debate the Milk Commission chairman. You didn't have a chance when you got the uh, newspapers behind you, <laughs> people who buy print. You, you want to make friends always with people who buy ink by the barrel. Uh, and so that came off very well. And uh, then there were hearings at the Agriculture Department. And one of the dairies <coughs> had hired a group of thugs. And they told me at that time that uh, they were going to burn down my house and kill my family. Now that was the only time that I was concerned about things. But fortunately, it was the time before people really got shot. So, you know, shooting activists didn't come along until a couple of years later than that. So I wasn't, uh, didn't have that perspective that uh, they really may do this, but I was very careful about things after that. Um, I was also wondering, um, you, you, you said you and Ron Fontaine opened Shelley's in 1978, and then you were still, it sounds like you've been active in the Republican Party all along. Since um, graduating from Tech. Since graduating from Tech. So, so did, did, did there ever, did the Republican Party, did the young Republicans, did they know that you owned and ran a gay bar? No. Or if they did, they didn't mention it. Mm -hmm. I guess the... Uh, did that ever come up? No, it never came up. Nobody in uh, no straight young Republicans ever came and said to me, I heard you're on a gay bar or anything like that. So it was never, it was never brought up. 
they wouldn't have known how to phrase it anyway because people just didn't talk about that. Uh, now the interesting thing to me was the word was out that I was running a gay bar because uh, one Saturday night, it was transitional on Saturday nights, it'd be a straight crowd coming in for dinner as well as a gay crowd. And I had a group coming in of 14 for a dinner that night and I went out on the floor and there sits my 18 year old nephew and a girl. So I told the manager, put all my guests back into the walk-in freezer until I get rid of Andy. <laughs> you know, I'm happy that made him. And I uh, told him, rush up their meal and I'll take care of it. And so we got them out of there. The next Saturday he was back again. <laughs> so we did the same thing again. The next Tuesday he comes in about 11 o'clock at night and he says, and I said, uh, Andy, this is obviously a gay bar. What are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm coming out and I need somebody to talk to. <laughs> so it turned out that the doctor he worked for in Jonesboro had told him, he told the doctor, and the doctor said, well, why don't you go talk to your uncle? He's running a gay bar. <laughs> So it was, it was well known yeah. <laughs> in, certain, cer in certain circles, in Better certain well known circles. Than I thought. <laughs> did you ever, uh, when, when did you, I don't know if this ever happened or not, but did you, did you start to um, ever uh, talk about uh, gay rights within the Republican Party? Not at that time, we weren't phrasing it like that. When, 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 we did, that, when did that start to come? Because I remember, <laughs> you, you, mentioned, you mentioned Goldwater, and, and Goldwater came out that was 64. Real, real, in 64, of course, but he came out later, you know, strongly in favor of, of, of gay rights. Yeah, much later. Much later, the much way, later, uh, right. He much had later. said to, uh, when the issue, I think when the issue came up about to the military the first time, Sam Nunn was on the other side, Goldwater had said to the president, uh, what you should have done was march the military in, tell them, that uh, there would be no discrimination of gays and tell them about face and send them away. Uh, Clinton wasn't in the military and didn't know how to handle the military. And so he gave in to Sam Nunn, which I thought was a constitutional crisis because Sam Nunn brought the military in as advocates and he should not have been trying to influence the military. Uh, but it was just too early. Mm -hmm. And of course it's getting closer now. It just took time. When did you get involved with the uh, Log Cabin Republicans, the, the, the gay group? Log During the uh, AEN days, Jim Wiggins, who was uh, on the national board of uh, Log Cabin Republicans, and he lived in New Orleans, he called me and said, we need a a uh, young Republican organization in Atlanta. So I said, I agree. Uh, not a young Republican, a lot of Kagan Republican. So I said, I agree, and I called Mansell McCord, uh, who was on our board of, at the AEN, and said, Mansell, you're interested in uh, the Republicans, you're a Republican, so call Jim Wiggins and see about uh, starting a log cabin Republican organization here. Um, and so Mansell got that started and Mansell stayed active in the Republican Party and he has been named to, um, he was the Republican representative for the 5th District Congressional District, but um, one of the things that I was impressed about with the log cabin Republicans was uh, that uh, we talked about you've got to work at the precinct level. So when the precinct meetings come along, send people to the precinct meetings, get elected to the county. They did that and during their first county meeting, the, uh, there was a very close contest for the uh, 
um, county chairman. And both sides had to come and negotiate with the log cabin Republicans to get elected. <laughs> so that's in the in the political in the professional part of the party. That's uh, it can be a quick rise because you have access to the precinct meetings and you can get yourself elected by just filling them up like Pat Robinson did. Um, I was also interested in asking about the human rights campaign because. Um, I know from talking to other people that the human rights campaign in Atlanta uh, started in 1988, and of course there were there were people involved before that. And so, were you were you part of that when when that came to Atlanta? In no, that was Edie Coffer. Okay. And Edie Coffer is a terrific person, and we sort of uh, had the deal: human rights is your organization, and we'll support you. AEN, I'll take care of. You support us. So we never really. Uh, I never really got involved with the human rights organization. Did you attend any functions, or mm -hmm. and did you go to the dinners? Yeah. Or? Okay. I did do that okay. for a while, but not regularly. Well, that's interesting when you mention that because um, you're almost sort of saying that that certain people in the larger LGBT community they they do certain things and you do other things, and and that's kind of like a kind of understanding or. Yeah. Uh, although that did not eliminate our members from going to the dentist. Right. So, uh, log cabin Republicans, that was just sort of autonomous with HRC, but people would be yeah, part of both. Were, and they were separate. Yeah, yeah. Was it, was it um, kind of uh, daunting when you first started Atlanta Executive Network? That was the first LGBT business organization? Well, it wasn't at that time. Okay. What uh, my mission was to position the Atlanta Executive Network as one of the power centers of Atlanta. Hmm. So we named it the Atlanta Executive Network rather than the Gay Atlanta Network or something like that. Uh, to be a business networking group. Mm -hmm. And then its format was everybody set at tables of round tables of eight with a facilitator and each person introduced themselves and talked about their business. And that of course developed a lot of business and new businesses. Uh, and then we had a speaker who was of national note like Bernie Marcus or Rebecca Dunn from Bell South Telecommunication, or senators and governors, or congressmen, uh, but mostly focused on business leaders. Was it hard to get people to come to a, speak to a gay group? Hard to get attendees or speakers? The speakers. No. So, uh, speakers we wanted are naturally busy, like Bernie, and so it took a year of talking to people about, do you know anybody that knows Bernie? Until finally Michael Aycock had a next door neighbor that knew him well and he arranged for him that way. Did you ever have a, any speaker who, who had like reservations about speaking to a, a, a gay group? No, nobody ever did that, but uh, the uh, Cynthia Tucker was one of our speakers when she was uh, editorial. Uh, on the editorial board of the Journal of the Journal of Constitution. And she came and with 15 handouts. And then she looked out and saw 400 people in suits. And <laughs> she said, I had a whole different concept of what I was going to find. And when she was leaving that night, we were walking out of the hotel. She said to me, you know, we really ought to cover this event. <laughs> I said, yeah, you really should. Are you are you pleased with um, the evolution since 1992, with with AEN and and other other uh, business uh, groups? Well, all organizations evolved. I was uh, just fortunate that God picked me to uh, work on AEN. Got started when I proposed that we do some business networking uh, when we were at a. Uh, uh, we, we had our Christmas Eve done at the Ritz downtown. Those are annual events. 
Christmas Eve dinner with basically all the leaders that I had worked with in community affairs, plus some other people who have been added since then. So Ken's probably been coming to Christmas Eve dinners for 20 years at least, but I think we're up to about 25 now. Uh, so that, um, uh, I'm not sure what your question was. Um, I was just uh, wanting to uh, find out, <coughs> excuse me, um, when, since you started AEN in 1992 uh, up to today, um, oh, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're pleased with, with how, you know, or any comments you have about the, the evolution of, of that. Well, uh, during my time, we were <clears> all amazed because we, at the beginning, said, well, if we ever have 200 members, we will really be a success. But we breezed right through 200 in no time at all mm. and wound up with 1,106 by the time I finished my term in 97. And then we had, from that board, Michael Aycock, Jim Noel, uh, Ronald Moore, who was head of uh, uh, human rights, uh, human resources at Hewlett Packard. Uh, we had them as chairman, and so it was very strong succession. After that time, as all organizations do, it sort of drifted off. The young leaders went to the AGLCC and energized it until it's the most energized organization. But JC, who is the president of the AEN now, is beginning to bring it back in a different form, but uh, he is uh, beginning to generate crowds again. Well, you've really been a, a mentor to a, a lot of uh, 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 other gay and lesbian uh, business, business persons. Yes, and that's been one of the joys of my life, and I helped. Anytime I could, I counseled with the community organizations. Uh, when AIDS came along, uh, Aid Atlanta did not have any money. <clears throat> and Jesse Peel asked me to do something about that. And I went down to uh, meet with Ken South and Ken Kimsey, who were running Aid Atlanta at the time in an office on Cypress Street. And I had a hard time getting out of the car because at that point we didn't know where AIDS was coming from, whether it was uh, track lighting or ferns or <laughs> where, it, where it was. So uh, I uh, got out, walked in, and uh, had a wonderful experience and told uh, asked them what they needed, and they had no money other than the mayor's grant and what money that the uh, decorators were giving them. Uh, and so I said, but they had no money for salaries, they had no money for operating expenses. People were dropping off, they uh, were dropping off, sons and daughters were arriving, and not daughters, sons were arriving that had been thrown out of their house and had no place to go. Doctors were not taking AIDS patients. Uh, funeral homes wouldn't bury them, nursing homes wouldn't take them. So I said, okay, we'll raise the money you need. And uh, so for about six months, starting with Richard Cole, who uh, was the first person I asked who uh, handled his business with syndicated television shows. And I remember one time he said, this far right, uh, Christian right guy came to us and wanted to buy one of my shows. And I told him, no chance, you're not getting that show. So at <laughs> any rate, I uh, asked him to join me. And the deal was $3,000. And so every Monday night, I'd take Kim Kim Zier, Kim uh, Sal, to the Ritz Hotel at cocktails and I would invite a couple of people and I'd say what I need you to do is give me three thousand dollars for this cause and of course at that time it hadn't spread much to the north side but they were still frightened but they didn't want anybody to know about it and one, one fellow did it in cash so that somebody at the bank if they saw his check wouldn't call his mother and uh, it wouldn't have made any difference because it was helping hands in Atlanta. So 
kept that up till I had raised $45,000, which in today's money that would be like about $250,000. And um, then I said, well, we should have done a, and in those days, have a cigar and talk about what we did. And so they said, oh, great. Uh, so I, and COVID said, well, we can do it at the Ansley Club. And several people said, oh no, my mother may come in there. And so that's just another place that they'd say, no, no, somebody will see us there. Finally wound up at Ritz Carlton downtown, second floor. And uh, on a Thursday night where nobody would be <laughs> except us. And um, the uh, waiters, uh, well, I had the speaker I had was uh, the, uh, the Fontaine arranged because it was his doctor, the head of the Atlanta Medical Association, who spoke about the fact that young doctors were graduating and thinking they were going to cure people, and all of a sudden their patients come in with an incurable disease, and it was very depressing to them. Um, and that night, the waiters contributed their tips. Somebody picked up the dinner bill, and it was $250 a head plus $35 for your dunk, which people always got an amusement out of because they said, wait a minute, I gave you $250, what's the $35? And I said, well, that $250's all got to go to the, uh, to the organization, <laughs> so we still have to pay for the dunk. Uh, they didn't have to pay for it that night. But then everybody said, well, we should have this regularly, and then we started having it on a quarterly basis. And I also, during that time, arranged with the legislature to, to appropriate $140,000, which was unheard of because the legislature was completely opposed to anything to do with AIDS, but it got through. And then one of the people at the Human Resources Department stole $40,000 of it, so we wound up with $105,000. Uh, she later, she later got arrested. <coughs> uh, Did you work with um, Gil Robeson? I think he was um, one of the the first LGBT lobbyists to the General Assembly. What was his name? Uh, Gil Gil Robeson. No, no, he didn't. Okay. I knew there were. Yeah. <coughs> people that were doing criminal mm -hmm. things like Jesse Beal, and uh, but. We were all on a different track. Mm -hmm. So a lot of different people doing different things. Like, I mean, you worked with Jesse, and then Jesse would do other things. And, but you all were in yeah. touch with one another. Yeah, and yeah. the drag queens would have events to raise money, and uh, so there were, uh, money was being raised from all sources. It was prior to that time and when AIDS came along, and people started having friends that got AIDS. And um, you did too, right? Oh yes, I lost 80% of my friends. Uh, it was mostly the hedonistic time, with sex, drinking, the whole thing. And then the curtain came down, and we were left in a circumstance of uh, being lepers with no services. So. The gay community had to come up with organizations that could deal with all the services, like Open Hand that uh, delivered meals, uh, Tuesday night dinners at the shrine where uh, it gave people with AIDS an opportunity to go out and have dinners. And that's where we learned to hug, because of course you were afraid at the time if you touched somebody you might get AIDS, but uh, we had to overcome that and hug all those people that came down that had AIDS. Uh, so we funded that. We funded uh, the startup Open Hand, uh, which Mike Edwards was heading. Uh, Aid Atlanta had, under uh, the uh, beer administration, had delivered uh, meals to people that didn't have microwaves that were frozen meals. That was what was going on. Mike went to San Francisco, learned how to do meals, and he came to us and said, if you give us the money for a month, then I'll show you what we can do. And so he was so impressive that we funded him. Uh, and on the way out of the door, I wrote him an extra check. Uh, 
because I had discovered during that period that I was not emotionally suited to being a buddy. It was too hard uh, on me, but I could focus on doing what I did well, which was raising money. And uh, <clears throat> so Open Hand got started. There were 11 organizations that we funded. Then by 88, I used to make all the executive directors meet on a monthly basis so they talk to each other, but they were usually fighting for territory and what have you otherwise. Uh, only when Ken Brett took over did he bring them all together. Uh, so that was an important time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um. You were talking about helping uh, Ken South and Ken Kimsey at Aid Atlanta, and then and then they were. Um, I know Ken South ended up getting fired at, at Aid Atlanta. Yes. And did did you were you in, were you? Um, I mean, you you were obviously a key supporter of Aid Atlanta, and so you did you get caught up in that or? Oh yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. They still hate me. Oh, they do. Because uh, <laughs> I uh, formed a committee of the of, uh, AEN and uh, other organizations like Aid Atlanta didn't have, didn't understand that we weren't trying to take them over. It was we were business people and we had our own business, so we were just doing this to uh, doing things for other people because uh, we wanted to. So we did a study of what was going on at Aid Atlanta and then met with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and they asked me to do something about it. And so I uh, met with the board and said, I want all of you to resign and we're going to bring in uh, leaders in the Atlanta community. And of course that went on like a lead balloon. <laughs> That's where hatred came from. But, and that finally occurred when Ken Brett, who was one of the great administrators, came in and hated by one administrative awards. Uh, so it took a few years, but it got itself organized correctly. But during that, after that time, I, we just funded, through Helping Hands, we funded all the startup of the other organizations. So, uh, PALS was uh, part of, not PALS, but uh, the uh, Buddy program was part of the Atlanta. So, we just funded it separately. The PWA's program, uh, which was part of the Atlanta, so we funded that separately and arranged for office space. 